right? Cloud, fat loss, right? There's all these marketing terms we get thrown around at us all the time, and it becomes really easy to become immune to them. Um, I mean, we're, we're constantly having, having marketing stuff tossed at us. When cloud first kind of became a word in the IT industry, right, when we ripped it off from the telecoms, uh, it had a real concrete, useful, technical meaning for about 10 minutes. And then marketing people got hold of it and ran away with it, and suddenly everything was a cloud. You can get your own personal cloud. No, that's a hard drive. It's, it's not, it's hooked up to the internet, sure, but that doesn't make it a cloud. So everybody kind of ran away with it. And the same thing happened with DevOps. DevOps as a term has actually been around for quite a while. It didn't really start to catch on until a couple of really, really good books about it. Like the Phoenix Project was, was kind of the definitive book that really got people's attention on it, uh, in, in a big way, I guess. Um, a lot of dot coms, you know, startups in, in the current era of, of startups started using this type of a, an approach. So DevOps actually meant something. And then the marketing people got hold of it. Uh, and you know, all of a sudden, it's, we're, we're DevOps. Here's DevOps in a box. Uh, and, and we, being who we are and, and what we do for a living, immediately started ignoring the word. Justifiably, I think. And so I wanted to do this talk to kind of, uh, kind of just, it, it's a real thing. DevOps is not a marketing word. I want people to pay attention to this because it is a real thing. However, it isn't something you can buy in a box. It's not shrink wrapped. You, you, can't, you can't just wake up one morning and go, oh, we should do DevOps. Let's just do that. It's a massive cultural change. It's a massive philosophical change in how you decide to do IT. You can apply DevOps principles to one tiny project within your organization if it's, if it's got some certain boundaries around it that allow that. You can run your entire IT organization according to these principles. But you have to understand what it's supposed to achieve, and you have to understand the trade-offs that you have to agree to make if you're going to go down this route. And so I, I found a keynote a couple of times about really at a high level what DevOps is supposed to be, uh, what it's supposed to, to be. But I don't often talk about what it actually looks like in terms of a concrete, what, what is this, if, if I'm doing this, how will I know? What's it look like? What buttons do I press to make DevOps turn on? And so that's what I wanted to do today, talk about DevOps. Um, it's not marketing. It really is about dev, developers, and ops, operations, working together for a common goal. And that goal is to smooth out the path between the coder and whoever's consuming that code, whether that's users or it's a service or something else. That is a really, 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 really important statement that you almost can't go any further until you embrace that. Let's, let's look at what's involved in getting an application or a service from a coder out to its user. For one, you have to start by coding it, right? People have, and about the only way to code is to push your, your fingers against buttons. That is a creative process, it's an artistic process. We can put a lot of tools in place to help make developers more efficient, but at the end of the day, code comes from the human mind. And so you can only do so much to smooth that part of it out. So now that the coder has finished, the coder has hit compile, a miracle has occurred, and now we have code. That's when ops traditionally takes over to get the code wherever it's going to be. We're deploying it to a server, we're deploying it out to client computers, wherever it is. We are almost nothing but a hurdle. Right? Any, any effort that is greater than zero means we are slowing things down. In an ideal world, the coder would just be able to close his eyes and squint really hard and the code would appear wherever it was supposed to be, right? That's ideal. That's impossible um, because developers don't have the, the psychic deployment powers like we do. Um, so anytime we get involved, we are automatically creating barriers. So our goal is to work with the devs to lower that barrier as much as possible, given some reasonable things like, you know, we don't want the universe to blow up every time this happens. So that's kind of what that is. This is not for everyone. There are some of you in this room and there are people in the room every time I talk about this who are going to think to yourself, you know, this makes sense. I'd like to work in this type of organization. Our organization will just absolutely never do this. You need to recognize if that's the case so that you do not start just banging your head into a wall. Uh, I get into a lot of conversations with folks. I had a great one with um, a young lady who works for a company that they do not have any internal software developers. 
And you know, that's fine, lots of stuff. It's a smaller company. She said, but how do I do this DevOps stuff with my, my vendors? You, you can't. They're, they're not going to be complicit in this. And, and she kind of got into this loop of, no, how can I make it work? You can't. You can't make it work. Right? That's like saying, I really, really want to drive this car on the ceiling upside down, so how do I make that? No, you don't. It, it's not what it's for. That's not how it works. So this isn't for everybody. You can definitely, even if it's not for you, there might be some nice pieces you can take from it. Uh, and maybe for certain projects, it's for you. But recognize when this is not the right tool. So uh, speaking of that, DevOps is not a collection of tools. You will need tools to do this. But DevOps is not something that you can go by. DevOps is an approach to managing IT. It is a, a, an approach to software delivery. Um, you guys know where this kind of came from, this whole DevOps movement? It came from Agile. Uh, software developers you know, started adopting these project management methodologies like Agile, where they could really iterate very quickly and produce new builds of software every day, every week, you know, whatever their, their cycle was. And then they would hand it off to ops, and we're like, maintenance window not scheduled until next Tuesday when Moon is full. And so they would have this huge pipeline of software that they were ready to deploy. And we're off over here implementing ITIL, which is essentially about stopping all movement in all molecules power, right? Who works in an ITIL shop? Yeah. Right? And everybody goes, something like that. Yes. We went to the DMV and said, how should we run our shop? <laughs> Essentially, what we did. So, DevOps came at, at, as kind of a, a reaction to that, which is we need to make ops more agile. And, and you, you'll actually hear talk. You'll hear about um, agile ops or agile IT, and you'll kind of hear those terms thrown around as well. DevOps is, is a little bit more popular. Um, you are going to need tools, though. You will either have to buy tools or build tools. This is where the concrete implementation starts to come in, because PowerShell, it turns out, is a great way to build tools to help you achieve some of these goals. And, and we'll talk about that. Um, some DevOps facts. The Puppet Labs did a, a, a state of, of the DevOps report in 2015. And we talked to a bunch of different companies who are really, really all in with this approach. 60 times fewer failures. 60. I want you to think of all the software deployment fails that you have had over the past year. And if you're thinking, yeah, it was about 60, well, they just took it to zero. 60 times your 168 times faster recovery when there is a failure. Do that math. If you had a failure that took 168 days to recover from, they just took it down to one day. That's a hugely important fact because part of DevOps is accepting the fact that you will have failures. You are going to screw something up just like you have always screwed things up. This is just acknowledging it and getting to a point where you can recover fast enough that it's not so painful when you fail. It's called fail with style. <laughs> okay? They got 30 times more deployments in the field. 30 times. That means instead of deploying something once per year, you deployed it once every couple of weeks, which means you're now moving features, you're removing bugs, you're getting code out to where it needs to be. You've massively improved the agility of the business and the business's ability to respond to changing conditions because you can react much faster. 200 times shorter lead for deploying. If it used to take you 200 days to get completed code out to the field, now it takes you one day. If it used to take you 200 hours, now it takes you one hour. These are a big, big deal. I mean, this is a, a massive change and there's a lot of benefits, but you have to acknowledge a few things. So let's, let's run through a quick example. Um, how many of you are familiar with Amazon Web Services Elastic Beanstalk? Okay, just a few folks. Go read up on it. I don't, it now if you're, no, my company will never, I don't care. I'm not telling you to buy it. I'm telling you to go read up on it. Because this is the ideal textbook definition of what DevOps actually should look like. Amazon themselves has taken on the role of ops. They are the IT operations department. And they have managed to, to remove almost all human interaction from the software deployment process while still making it safe, 
fast, reliable, and predictable. Here's how it works. I'm a dev, okay? I'm writing my little web app that's gonna get run in Amazon. Let's say it's in you know, PHP or, or whatever goofy crap kids these use these days. As part of that, in a little folder, I have a text file. And the text file describes the type of environment that I want my app to run in. Whatever packages I need, whatever add-ins, whatever DLLs or da 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 da, right? I need this much RAM, I need this type of processor, I need this type of OS, I need these things in it. One of the biggest places where we fall down in deploying software is that the damn developers never tell us what's supposed to be running when we put it in production, right? They sit in their little ivory tower world, and they're like, oh wow, my code didn't compile. Oh, I was missing this package, I'll just install it. Look, it compiled. And they don't ever clue us in the fact that that package has to be there for the code to work, right? And that's when we run into failure. We push that sucker out live, and it blows up in a million pieces, because nobody actually wrote down what it was we were supposed to deploy. And when they do write it down, what's that deployment doc look like? You get like a Word doc, right? Yeah, it needs this, and this, and this, and this, or maybe it's a ticket. It, it's, not, it's not something we can consume easy. It's too easy for us to screw that up. So in this model, the devs put a text document as part of their project. And it's a text document I could read, and it's a text document that the computer can read. In Microsoft terms, we might call this a moth. Right? So what happens is somebody says, OK, let's, let's deploy the app, maybe to a test environment. Maybe that's what we're going to do first. Amazon sucks in all the project code, including that, that file. It sets up the environment. It compiles the application. It injects the code into the virtual machine. And then it starts running whatever automated tests you've set up. <coughs> this is key, because the code only runs in an environment that was set up by the automation engine. So if the developer forgot to specify something, his tests are going to fail. And he can't just run in here and, oh, yeah, right, I forgot such and such a package. He's got to go back. He's got to modify his configuration document to indicate what package was missing. He's got to push the button again. The deployment engine will spin down the old environment and spin up a new one that meets the new criteria. So by the time he gets it working, we know we've got this nailed. So what, what Amazon literally does is you can, you can ping their REST API or you can go to their dashboard and you can say, update app. It spins up however many virtual machines, sucks the source code into them, configures those virtual machines, sets their memory, sets the processor class, installs whatever packages you need, sets environment variables, registers those with the load balancer, deregisters the old ones, and then destroys the old ones. Everything that we're used to doing manually, they just got as a bunch of Python scripts. We might do that with a moth. Maybe we just tell the developer, look, I'm going to teach you how to write DSC configuration scripts. And you're going to drop a DSC configuration script in as part of your project. And when we go to deploy your project, I'm going to take that and I'm going to use it to create a moth. And that's how I'm going to configure the environment. So let's, let's dig into that a little bit more. Setting up that environment, tools like DSC, Chef, Puppet, Ansible, Salt, SEBMM, this is designed to read the application's environment needs from that document and then set up the environment appropriately, including dependencies like packages or DLLs or whatever other dependencies might exist. We're now documenting those things in a way that can be automated. Now, it sounds hard when you just talk about it, but really think about it. How many of you think you could probably rig this up, at least in like a trial situation, using something like maybe DSC or Shaper Puppet? Yeah, the, the technologies all exist at this point. We can actually do this. We, we don't have like a complete pipeline product that we can just go buy that will magically do all this, but all the pieces exist, and we'll talk about some of those pieces. So, Setting up the environment is straightforward. How many of you think you could automate the creation of a VM if, if I pushed you to it? Yeah, and a lot of you already have. If you've got something like DSC or Chef or Puppet or whatever, how many of you think you could automate the provisioning of that, that environment once the VM is up? Of course you could, absolutely. 
How many of you think you could have a developer give you a, a PowerShell configuration, a DSC configuration script? You can run that, produce them off. But then you could also have your own operational concerns configuration script, which you could run and produce them off. So now you've got the stuff the developer needs, but you've also got the stuff you need, the security, the firewall, the things the developer might not necessarily care about, getting your management agent installed or whatever else. And you just hand both of those to the LCM. OK, I'll, I'll do that. I'll configure it. I'll set it up, boss. Right? We have all this. We have the pieces. So once the environment is up, standard compilers just get called to compile your code. Um, or you can take it out of a, a checked in source control repository, right? When someone says go, you just get the latest check in from source control that's passed whatever validation it has. That code gets injected into the new VM. Tools like Team City can help you do this. These exist, they're out there. And then if it's a test environment, once it's up and running, you run automated tests against it. Now, the exact tools you use to create those tests are going to depend on your software dev environment. Right? If you've got Microsoft developers who are doing .NET, you're going to use the, the, the tools that are part of Visual Studio to create these automated tests. If you're pushing PowerShell code, you're going to use something like Pester. If you're pushing Python code, they've got automated test engines as well. So you're going to use the, the, the matching testing framework. You run the tests against the code. If the tests fail, you bounce it back to the developer. You decommission the environment. You destroy it. They've got all the evidence they need to go try again. This isn't any effort on your part. It's all automated. It happens when the developer sits in their, their visual studio and they say, go. A miracle occurs. We create the miracle and then we just watch it lovingly from afar. If the tests pass, then you repeat the entire process in the production side of the environment. Because the tests pass. All right, where's the weak spot here? Just because the tests pass, am I guaranteed that this is going to work perfectly in production? No, no, I'm not. This is where you have to be willing to accept failure. You get to production. Oh, God, we missed something. Fine, roll back, do the whole process again with the last known good version, which is still in source control, which is why we use source control kits. Get the last known version, repeat the whole process. How long do you think it would take for most applications? From the time you go, oh, crap, it's not working. Push the abort button. How long do you think it would take to go get the old version of the source code, spin up the environment, and get the old version running in production again? Seconds to minutes. It's quick. Quick like money. Quick, 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 quick. Because we've automated it all. And we know it's going to work because the last time we did it with that version, it worked fine. There's no reason it shouldn't work fine this time. So now that you know it failed in production, you know you forgot to test something in your automated tests. Now, production's back up and running. Everybody can breathe easy. Go fix your tests, right? OK, well, that didn't work out so well. So let's make sure that we're going to test for that situation again next time, and we'll catch it. So you failed, but you recovered quickly. And the learning process, right? Because we're supposed to learn from failure. Most places are, are supposed to have the attitude that it's OK to fail as long as we learn and we don't do it again. Your learning process is going and updating those tests. That's code. The next time you run those tests, the computer is going to do it exactly the same way every single time. And so you have learned and you have improved your automated environment's ability to resist error the next time. And you were only down for a few minutes. Small price to pay because what we do now is we ship it out after spending a ton of time wasted trying to ensure we will have no failure. We have failures anyway. And our learning process is everyone standing in a room screaming at each other, hoping to God the developers remember to test it the next time so it doesn't happen again. Well, this is a much more codified form of failure. It's a form of failure that leads to improvement. You can point to it. You can chart the number of failures you have, and you can chart the number of things you're testing. That's why people like this. Managers can get behind this because they can see the gradual improvement over time. Make sense? So we run our automated tests, uh, and like I said, Elastic Beanstalk is the perfect example of this. You're shaking your head. I just, I just. In disbelief, or? No, I don't know what it is. Oh, Elastic Beanstalk is just that. It's an Amazon service. 
you point it at your, your Git repo, and your project needs to have a configuration file, not unlike a moth, different because they have their own format. And you say, okay, deploy it, go. They spin up some VMs, they read your configuration file, they install packages, they do whatever, they suck your source code over, they put it where it's supposed to go, they register the VM with a load balancer and make it available to the public. It takes about 10 seconds. And it's the perfect implementation of DevOps. And a lot of people will look at that and go, well, that can't be DevOps because there's no ops. It's just the dev deploying stuff. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> there is ops. Amazon is the ops. They've just automated human beings out of that sequence because we don't scale well and we make mistakes. In this way, we've taken the one piece of the pie we cannot automate, coding. And we've made that the highlight feature, and everything else is automatic after that. Yeah, but does that mean developers can deploy stuff straight to production? It means that depending on how you set up your pipeline, developers can deploy directly to a test environment. And if all the tests pass, does that mean it automatically goes to production? Well, no. It's how you set it up. Maybe if the tests pass, it logs a help desk ticket and says, we're ready for deployment. And then during your next maintenance window or your next release cycle, you know, after you've had a chance to let your users know this is coming, whatever your process is, you push the button and it all happens automatically from there. So you can still have business process cutouts. And for some projects, you're gonna want that. For other projects, you're not gonna want that. You're just gonna want it to sail automatically through. It's gonna depend on the situation and your business needs. So ops still exists. Right? People make this mistake that DevOps is no ops, and that's not the case. We're still there. We've just automated all the finicky bits, and we become decision makers, because that's what people do well. Right? We're really good at, at, at processes and, and making decisions about those processes. Where we suck is when things get boring, right? And we're deploying the app again. And, and we just had all that package and that. And, and, and. Oh, crap, I missed two things, and it exploded. Right? We're not good at, at consistently doing repetitive things over and over and over and over and over. But we're really good at those decisions. And so we just take on a human role. Now, I, um, I've got a couple of, of companies that I, I talk to that do this. Uh, and there's a lot of companies that do it. A couple I talk to that do it really well. And what they found is they've basically removed most of their second tier of IT. They've got a help desk to unlock people's passwords, right? Because you do. And then they've got engineers, high level, tier three folks, who write all this. They write all the code necessary to automate all this. And that's about it. That's all they have. So um, what about failure? This is the, tw the Twitter fail well? You're, you're going to fail. You've always failed. Like I said, this is just a way of, of codifying that failure and making sure that what you learn from that failure can't happen again because you've got a process in place that's coded. So um, one more thing. It, it's fun to talk about all this, but a lot of folks will get a little bit stuck on, okay, let's say I don't have software developers. That means I don't really need to do this, right? Well, yes and no. You guys have all heard the, the, the term infrastructure as code, right? I hate that, it's syntactically wrong. Um, Infrastructure from code is fine. Infrastructure from code. If you, how many of you have, have a vision, even if you're not doing it, have a vision of having all of your servers managed by something like DSC or Chef Republic? Well, boys and girls, that's code. That DSC document, that configuration script and the moth that, that comes from it, that's code. This exact same pipeline applies to you. Here's my DSC configuration script. Push the button. Compile, here's the moth. Let's spin up a virtual machine. Let's inject the moth into the VM. Let's let the LCM do its dance. And then when it's done, we're gonna run a bunch of automated tests to make sure the environment is configured the way we wanted it to be. And if it is, then that code, that DSC configuration script, is approved for use in production. And we can push the other button and start spinning up new servers with that thing. 
Okay, times change. You know what, we're switching AV vendors now. Uh, we're gonna use different anti-malware on our servers. So I'm gonna go change my DSC configuration script to remove the old stuff, make sure it's not there. Make sure the new stuff is there. Make sure it's configured correctly. Deploy it to the test environment, spin up the VMs, run the tests against it, looks good. Push it to production. All my servers reconfigure themselves consistently every single time. Infrastructure from code means that we are developers. Sorry. <coughs> Probably didn't think that was going to happen when you came out this week, but you're a dev now. So, infrastructure from code means we can use this same pipeline to manage our infrastructure. And this is way better than, well, how did it used to be, right? Let's say you change management agents. And now you got to go around and uninstall the old one and install the new one on, on how many servers do you have? 500? 1,000? You have two ways of doing that. You can do it yourself manually by running around and doing it, right? Actually, a couple of ways, more than two. You can do it manually. You sitting in this room probably would have written a script to do it. But scripts in that kind of situation can be a little delicate, right? Anybody ever script something like that in the past? Did it work perfectly on every single machine? Now, because you've always got those little special ones out there that are broken for. And then your third option is that new thing, the intern net, where you go to a college and you get a couple of kids and you don't pay them, and they run around and do it manually. <laughs> but wouldn't it be better if you could have a, a policy-driven infrastructure where you just say, look, this is what you need to be today, and if that ever changes, I'll let you know. And you can run all that through this DevOps pipeline where we are both dev and ops, and we automate the ops piece of it, and we focus on that creative human part, the, the dev piece, our code, our configuration. Could you see yourself running things this way? See, DSC, Chef, Puppet, all of them, they're scary as hell if you're not doing this. If you're not pushing things through tests and testing and building it as a pipeline where it goes from a successful test out into production, just, just whacking out moth files, that's scary. <clears throat> but this automates all the ugly bits, the testing and everything else. How many of you have, have played with DSC, the provisioning machine? Okay. So you wrote your configuration script, yeah? You, you ran it, so you got them off, right? Um, when you were just starting to do this, did you did you just push it out to the node first time? Yeah. Yeah, minus, minus verbose, minus weight, right? Just to see what happened. And when it ran, so we, the, the first time you got it to run without errors. Remember that? Remember how that felt? <laughs> What did you do next? It ran without errors. What's the very next thing you did? Source control. You did not put it to source control next. <laughs> That's what I did. You already keyed into the server, <laughs> didn't you, to yeah. see if it worked? Yeah. Of course you did. Because you don't believe it. <laughs> All we're doing is talking about automating that piece. Instead of you already getting into the server and looking around with your, your human eyeballs, we want the, the machine to do it. Have the machine go check. Did you do this? Did you do this? Did you do this? Did you do this? Is this, is this true? Is this true? You can write a little script for it. We've got testing frameworks, but if you just want to write a, write a little script, you can even do that. And once the machines, because the machine is going to be able to check all those things a lot faster than you, and it's going to do it every time. It's not going to remember or, or forget. Make sure it's in the domain. That's important. Make sure it's got an SSL certificate. Make sure it's got an HTTPS listener for remoting. Make sure the HTTP listener is turned off. Right? You're going to forget at least one of those things at some point. The computer will never forget. So you, you build those checks. You don't RDP into the server, please, for the love of all that's holy. Stop RDPing in your servers. Okay? Not an option with Nano, so we're going to have to figure out how to automate this anyway. So you automate it. Let it check it. And if it says thumbs up, you have to leave it. And it might be wrong. You might have forgot to test something, and that's fine. You, you'll figure it out. But then go back and add it to the test. Create that confidence in your code. And that's really what DevOps is. Failure is always an option here. It was always an option. We always failed. You know, one of the reasons, um, so, you know, with Puppet Labs, if you dig into that state of DevOps, I think that number, 200 times shorter lead time to deployment. You know why? because they eliminated all this human QA effort, where it was, okay, here's the code, now we're gonna have some monkeys sit here and just pound on it. 
They're going to run through scenarios. They're going to try and break stuff. It's going to be a little random. They're not really going to collect data, so the developers are going to get frustrated. And we're going to go back and forth and fight with each other. And the devs are going to say it's fixed. And then we're going to do the whole cycle again. And they're going to find something different. And they're going to send it back. And they'll have enough data. That's why it took so long. Because that QA process was too, too random, too not automated, too inconsistent. All this does is it flights all that a lot faster. It's consistent. You're still going to fail. How many of you have ever seen a, a big code deployment go out with zero bucks? No, that's not true. They all go out with zero bucks. <laughs> <laughs> it's not until the users touch them and infect them. right? You know that's where bugs come from. They're infected. Users infect code. But it happens all the time. It's always happened. It's always going to happen. But at least this way, we can get a less screwed up version a lot quicker. Here's why a lot of developers like this. Um, rather than deploying one giant thing every year that has 800 moving parts, because when something breaks, not if, when something breaks, you've got 800 moving parts to look at. They would most of them much prefer to ship out something every week that only changed one or two things. Because if they break it, they're pretty sure what they broke. Right? The other problem you get with these long release cycles, these, you know, let's, let's work on it for six months or a year, is by the time you get to the end and you ship the code, the guy who started the code doesn't work for your company anymore. Right? Either his brain has changed because he's lived through six or, six or 12 months of life, or he's quit and gone on because he can't believe you can't deploy software any faster than that. But you do these things quickly and constantly in small, tiny, tiny bits. Then when something does break, yeah, pretty sure I know what that was because we only changed that one line that said Y2K, don't touch. We touched it. We should go put that back. So it's really easy to recover a lot faster. So us letting them ship more stuff, because who are your best beta testers? Who's really going to find all your bugs? Your users, because they're infecting the code. So you might as well shorten the path for getting the code out to your users, because that's where all the testing happens anyway. And if you can do it in small bits, and again, this is the same with infrastructure, infrastructure from code. Don't save up all the changes you want to do to your servers for a once every five year you know, nightmare cluster. All right, change one little thing at a time. Okay, we're just going to push this out. Oh, that went well, great. Okay, let's do the next thing. Let's push that out. And we can do it constantly and iteratively and evolve things rather than having massive revolution all the time. This is one of the reasons Microsoft is trying to shift their own model over to this, is so that they can just ship small little bits and gradually evolve the operating system, rather than have, having to come up with a brand new user interface and rearrange the entire control panel every five years. Right? Which is all Windows has ever done, right? New UI, new control panel, that's it. <laughs> so, so the model you're describing, so far, my understanding of it is very node-oriented. And during Deacon's talk uh, about uh, VMware, it would but one mind away said, oh, he had to instantiate a system to use its LCM to manage the rest of the environment. Um, so when you compare it to Beanstalk, where this is a whole infrastructure and that descriptive thing you're talking about, it wasn't just one node, it was all sorts of things. How does DSC kind of map to, we're not just- So, so, so yeah, so this, this does not really talk about just one node. Um, take Elastic Beanstalk, for example. Um, if, if you work for a large company and you've got an enormous website, that push the button might be spinning up 300 VMs. Some of those might be a database. Some of them might be front end servers. It's the whole application. Same thing here. Same thing here. Um, you usually try to segment your environment into functional chunks, which we kind of do that anyway, right? You know, I mean, if, if you've got a, a three tier application, you kind of have its back end and its middle tier and. and we, we try, at least, not to cross things, right? We want one server to basically do kind of one role in the environment. Um, yeah, you might have machines that are, are AD and DNS and DHCP, but we call those infrastructure servers, and that's a role, and we try not to put anything else on those, right? And so you can have multiple things happening as, as part of an operation. You just try to put some, some role boundaries around it so that you can manage those things as a unit. And I, I use the word virtual machine a lot. Might not be a VM, might be a container. Might be client machines. How many of you have ever screwed up a group policy? Because <laughs> you're live editing the stupid things. There's not a save button. I wonder what happens if I click, what's the screaming all about? <laughs> <laughs> so 
So I mean, we, we can absolutely apply these types of things to the existing infrastructure, the way we already do things. Remember, this is an approach. This is a sort of a, a guidance on how to go about this. It's not a fixed set of tools. It's not a fixed set of scenarios. We can use examples using concrete things like DSC or Elastic Beanstalk. But those are just examples of the philosophy. And that's really what this is. You can apply the philosophy to anything. So comparison. Before DevOps, your recovery and response took a long time. The reason most companies are so fearful of failure is because when something does fail, it fails for a long time. Right? Most of us can handle a stubbed toe because it heals in five minutes or so. It's the broken leg that's a real pain because then you're in the chair for you know, 10 weeks. After DevOps, that response and rec the, the recovery and response can be really fast. Failure becomes less serious because it's less impactful. Um, before DevOps, everything, everything was mission critical. How many of you have been told that email is mission critical? That's bullshit. <laughs> I know it's inconvenient when email isn't up, but no one died. Okay? There are places where nearly every application is mission critical, and those places are called hospitals because people die when things break. If no one's going to die, then you can handle a failure for a few minutes or an hour or whatever. I know it's inconvenient, but if you move over to a DevOps model, you can start to realize that, yeah, not everything is so mission critical. We can afford to be down for a little while. We can stomach a little inconvenience. What we couldn't stomach was, yeah, email is down. It's going to be down for several hours, and when it comes back up, everything's gone. Right? That's why everyone said, oh, it's mission critical. They didn't actually mean it is critical to our mission. They meant, I know when this fails, it's going to be biblical, and I, we can't handle that. Before DevOps, we know that change breaks things, so let's just not change, ever. Let's implement a management framework that has an entire committee who sits down once a month to discuss how they're not going to approve anything. And we call it ITIL. After DevOps, though, change is fine. You can be more agile. We have to change. We know we have to change. How many of you have organizations who, from a business perspective, are just pressing IT to do it faster? Yeah. You know, maybe don't outsource your VM management to a company that has a six-month spin-up SLA, just as a suggestion. But they're pressing us because we need to be more agile, and we can, because change becomes less scary because we have a recovery plan that's fast and that'll work. Um, DevOps is, is not just one thing. It's going to look different in every single organization. It's going to look different in nearly every single project. But let me just give you kind of a, a quick example of how this probably will change your IT organization. Um, how many of you have separate dev and operations and maybe even like a network infrastructure team, like fairly siloed IT? That goes away. It has to. And this is where we have to look at whether our organization is willing to do this. What it needs to be is not, for, how many users have walked into the office and said, man, looking forward to getting that IP address today. <laughs> <laughs> it never happens. We even fool ourselves. Remember we went down this whole virtual desktop infrastructure? How many users come in and say, oh, I love my desktop. Love it. They want their apps, they want their services. And so we have to reorganize IT. If we're going to do DevOps, we've got to be organized around apps and services. So what it can look like, for example, is here's the corporate application team. It's got 10 developers and two ops guys and a network infrastructure guy. And they work together on that. And incidentally, those same two ops guys are also on this other project team because they're lending their ops expertise to that team and telling the developers, look, in order for us to really smooth this out, let's do it. And, and we are all on this boat together. So let us help each other make it happen. If you could put these two things into your code, we're gonna be able to make it much quicker and easier for everybody else, so let's do that. And they have access to that in real time. And those guys float to whatever projects they're assigned to. And then all the ops guys, and all the infrastructure guys, and all the developers have a guild. 
And that doesn't have anything to do with the project. That's just where the, the network infrastructure guys all get together for lunch every month or so and say, so how's it going on all the projects? And one of them go, yeah, you know what? We really found out that this one brand of switch that, that we're trying out rocks. It's a little easier to manage. So you know, as you guys start moving into the project, you might look at that. That was really successful. And somebody else can say, yeah, you know what? Uh, we figured out that this router over here blows up every Tuesday. And all of our problems have been stemming from this one place. And so they share their domain knowledge with each other, but they're not organized that way. You don't just have a bunch of people who are disconnected from reality managing IP addresses in an Excel spreadsheet. You organize around what is delivering to the business. And if you're going to do DevOps, even for a small project, the team has to look like that. Everybody who's contributing to it needs to be in the boat. It's the only way you can make it work, because otherwise, what do you wind up with? You get these walls. You get these communications walls. You get these direct report to hierarchy org chart walls. It's not healthy. It's not conducive to getting the job done. One thing you probably start noticing, too, is that um, projects that fail all the time have the same people on the project, and they start cutting them back. Projects that fail all the time, that have a, a common human resource element, you can start to look at that. You do have to change how you think about this. So where do you begin? Small. Do not go home and say, hey, you know that one giant project that actually makes the entire company run every single day? Let's DevOps that sucker. Go find something little. Find something low stakes, because there's going to be a learning process. You're going to have to build some tooling. You're going to have to experiment, see what works for your organization. Experiment somewhere lower impact, less mission critical. Start small and then grow from there. And if you're, if you're like, yeah, no, I work for a bank. We can't do, uh, actually, most of the companies that are really leading DevOps right now are financial services companies because they're under such pressure to push out websites and mobile apps and all this other stuff, and this is the way they're actually getting it done, so you can do it. How many of you are thinking, yeah, but my company's a little different? No, you're not. All companies are different. <laughs> all of them. You're all equally weird in different ways. And that's why you're probably going to be building a lot of your own tools. You might start with building components, that somebody else that, that you buy, but you're going to glue everything together on your own. You might go get a box of Legos, but you're going to put them together in your own way. And that's how you accommodate for your differences. That's why DevOps is not something that you can just go buy at, you know, do we have software stores anymore? Amazon. You can't buy DevOps at Amazon unless you're buying it from Amazon Web Services, who does it quite well. Um, Okay, uh, a little bit of a reading list here. Um, there's a book called Continuous Delivery, Reliable Software Releases Through Build, Test, and Deployment Automation. Um, the Visible Ops Handbook, and then the Phoenix Project, which is actually a really good read. Mark, do you have a book? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, uh, are there cases where somebody's actually written a 5, 10, 15 page white paper that says, this is, here's a real example, these are the examples, these are the, this is the products, these are the scripts, yeah. Something small, like you said, start from something small. Yeah, yeah right, yeah. Um, yeah, so is there an example of somebody who's written something concise and small about this? Uh, Spotify. Go, go punch in Spotify DevOps, and they have reorganized their entire company along these lines. So, thanks, guys. I'll see you around.